day two of Heidelberg Catechism begins the section on the misery of man. Whence knowest thou thy misery? Out of the law of God. What doth the law of God require of us? Christ teaches us that briefly in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Canst thou keep all these things perfectly? In no wise, for I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbour. Beloved, when you look into the mirror, are you happy with what you see? I'm not talking tonight about the mirror in your bathroom. I'm not talking about your physical appearance. I mean, when you look into the spiritual mirror of the law of God, are you happy with what you see? Because that's the figure used in James chapter 1. And there we read of a man who looks into the mirror of the perfect law of liberty, sees his reflection for a moment, but then forgets what he looked like. He's the one who, hearing the word of God, has not put that word into practice. But when you, beloved, and when I look into the perfect law of liberty, are we happy with what we see? What kind of image, what kind of reflection looks back at us? Many would answer that question with, yes, I am happy with what I see. Many in the church world who are self-righteous will answer, oh yes, I am perfectly satisfied or quite happy or rather pleased with what I see. That's because such people have not looked into the right mirror. You could put it this way. You go to many churches, it's like a hall of mirrors in that church. And they hold up various mirrors before the people and show them distorted images of themselves. And when such people, having been deceived for perhaps many years, finally come across the correct mirror, which is the Word of God, which is the Law of God in particular, they are appalled. And they quickly say to themselves, I'm not going to look into that mirror any longer. It's something like the fairy tale of Snow White. You remember the Queen in Snow White, she had a magic mirror. And she said to the mirror, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And the magic mirror would respond, oh, you are the fairest of them all. Until one day, of course, she discovered there was someone else fairer than she was, and that was Snow White, and that's how the whole fairy tale unfolds. But many people think of the law of God as a magic mirror, which is to tell them how wonderful they are, but that's not what the law of God is supposed to do. The law of God does not tell us how wonderful we are. The law of God reveals to us how miserable we are. That's question and answer three. Whence knowest thou thy misery? In Lord's Day 1, we have been seeing that there are three things which are necessary for the child of God to know comfort, the first of which is, how great my sins and miseries are, and therefore, Lord's Day 2 begins with the question, whence knowest thou thy misery? How do you know that you're miserable? And the answer is, out of the law of God. And so 
a child of God who understands his true spiritual condition, who believes the gospel and is comforted by the gospel, answers this question, what do you see when you look into the mirror of the law of God? I see a terribly ugly reflection. I see a reflection so ugly and so hideous that I cannot bear to look at it. I see myself. I see myself staring back in all of my sin. And when I see myself in that condition, I am miserable. When the child of God sees his reflection in the mirror of God's law, the child of God weeps. Not flattered, not pleased, but even slightly pleased, but the child of God weeps. And that weeping, that misery, is necessary for the child of God to know the comfort of the gospel. Notice then our misery reflected in God's law. Our misery reflected in God's law. Notice first the perfect mirror, then the ugly reflection, and finally the miserable Christian. If you want to know what you look like, you need to get the right mirror. And the perfect mirror, which gives the accurate reflection, is the law of God, because the law of God gives us the perfect standard against which God measures. And the law consists of all of the moral and ethical demands which God the Creator has for His creatures. In the Bible, there are hundreds and hundreds of laws, especially in the first five books, Genesis to Deuteronomy. And when Jesus Christ walked the streets of Palestine during his earthly ministry, the law of God was a very important topic for the Jews. In fact, there were whole classes of Jews, Pharisees, scribes in particular, who made it their business full time to study the law of God. And they spent hours upon hours discussing and debating the law of God. All of the details had to be worked out by these scribes and Pharisees. Details such as what are the proper grounds for divorce? There are various viewpoints on that. How much weight may a man carry on the Sabbath day? And the prevailing opinion was the weight of a dry fig. And by the time that Jesus came along in his earthly ministry, the Jews had been discussing these things for centuries and had divided themselves up into various groups and schools. Some were more strict than others. And one of the hotly debated questions of the day was the one that this scribe poses to Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 12, also given in Matthew chapter 22. Which is the first commandment of all? Or which is the great commandment in the law? Now that was not an easy question. It was a question which had been debated for many years by the various schools of scribes and Pharisees. In fact, the rabbis, the teachers of the law, had by this time amassed 613 different commandments. 365 were negative, thou shalt not, one for every day of the year. And 248 were positive, thy shalt. And the rabbis spent much of their time arguing over which one of these is the most important, which is a lesser commandment, and which is a more important one, and which is the most important of all. 
Now some say that Sabbath observance, those kind of commandments that deal with Sabbath observance, those are the most important and the most weighty. Others said no, circumcision, that's the most important. Others said no, laws about sacrifices or tithing, those are the most important. Others said, well, which ones are capital offences? Which have the stiffest penalty for disobedience? They must be the most important. And into this theological debate steps Jesus Christ in the last week of his earthly ministry. <coughs> because his enemies want to trap him. And we read about that in Mark chapter 12. There were various traps set for Jesus already. First of all, they asked him about Caesar and ought one to pay tribute or taxation to the Roman government. And Jesus answered, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Then the Sadducees came along with their trick question about the resurrection. And Jesus answered them by quoting from the law of Moses. And now comes a scribe, or as Matthew's account says, a lawyer, that is one who is an expert in the law, with another trick question. He doesn't come with a question with sincerity, but he comes, as Matthew 22 says, tempting Jesus. And the Pharisees, and this scribe in particular, who was sent by the Pharisees, thought by asking this question, they put him on the horns of an ethical dilemma. How will he be able to answer this question to the satisfaction of the people? There are 613 laws to choose from. Which one is he going to say is the most important? Choose the wrong one, and you alienate one or more of the pharisaical schools, one or more of the rabbis. Choose the wrong one, and you are going to be seen as soft on part of the law of God. You're going to lose some of your credibility with the people. The Pharisees will say, see, he's soft on the law of God. Let's say that Jesus says that Sabbath observance is the most important. See, he neglects circumcision. Let's say he says that circumcision is the most important. See, we told you, he's against tithing. Let's say a sacrifice is bad, he's weak on the Sabbath day. We suspected it already. So what's he going to say? How is he going to answer this tricky question? Jesus' answer is basically this. Look, you scribes and you Pharisees. You've spent all of this time arguing about the little details of all the law, all about the individual laws, and you've really missed the entire point of the law. The whole essence of keeping the law of God is devotion and love to the lawgiver himself. That's how you keep the law. You love the one who gave the law. You see the law as a reflection of the perfections of the character of God himself and so you love his law and you keep his law. Love the lawgiver and all of these details will simply fall into place. And this was something new for the Pharisees, because the Pharisees and scribes of that day had so corrupted the law of God that they thought that everything depends upon the outward observance of the various commandments. And Jesus says, no, no, he did this also in the Sermon of the Mount, no, it's not the outward observance that's important. It's the inward motivation that's important. There's no point having this outward observance if you don't love the God who gave you the law in the first place. But that's not the case with our human laws. With our human laws, there is no necessity to love the lawgiver. Take, for example, 
those of you who drive a car, the speed limit. Love it or loathe it, you have to keep the speed limit, get caught and you pay a fine. Or you get penalty points on your license. But do you love the minister or transport? Do you even know his name? Do you love the Garda Traffic Commissioner? Do you know his name? Doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. As long as you obey the speed limit, you are keeping the law. But that's not good enough for God. God is not satisfied by mere outward obedience which ignores Him. He's the lawgiver. Take, for example, the fourth commandment. Here we are this evening, outwardly keeping the fourth commandment by coming diligently to the house of God. But simply coming to the house of God is not necessarily keeping the fourth commandment because why do you come to the house of God? Why do you refrain from working on the Sabbath day? In Amos, there are people who would outwardly obey the fourth commandment, who would sit in the synagogue and they would say to themselves, Oh, when will the Sabbath day be over so that we can sell and buy corn and oppress the poor? That was what they were thinking about as they heard the sermon. And we can have that as well. Oh, when will the service be over so I can go home and do what I want to do? And there can be a certain amount of resentment in our heart even that God would demand of us that we come and worship him on the Lord's day. God therefore desires to have the heart, desires and demands to have the affections of his people directed toward him. Or let me use an illustration from everyday life. Let's say a parent has a child who is playing his video game, enjoying himself playing that video game, and the parent says to the child, okay, I want you to set the table for dinner, stop playing your video game, and the child gets up, stomps into the kitchen, bangs the drawers, puts all the things on the table, banging them on one by one, glares at his parents and stomps back into the living room, but he has actually laid the table. Would you say, if you were a parent, that that was obedience to you? Would you be satisfied with that kind of obedience from your child? Well, of course you would be, because all the attitude is wrong. You can see in the demeanor of the child He's not happy at having to obey you. He did not do it out of love for you. He did not do it gladly, but he did it negligently. And he didn't really want to do it. He dragged himself into it and protested all the way through it. But the law of God demands, as Jesus himself summarizes in Matthew 22 and Mark 12 that we love God when we obey Him. And so the Lord does not ask of us the question, do you obey God, but do you love Him? Take one of the other commandments, take the eighth commandment, thou shalt not steal. Did you steal this week? Or did you refrain from stealing? Did you refrain from stealing grudgingly? Did you really want to steal something but you decided not to because you were afraid of the consequences? Perhaps you were afraid of being caught and branded a thief. You didn't want the shame and the punishment which comes from being a thief. Or did you Refuse to steal because you love the God who says, I shall not steal. 
And what does it mean to love God? Did you display a deep, ardent affection for God in everything that you did this week? Did you delight in God as the highest and as the only good? Did you set your heart upon God as the greatest of all treasures? Did you say in your heart, as you thought about doing any particular thing this week, I would rather die and suffer terrible punishment than displease my God in the slightest thought, word, or deed? Did you love God or did you simply love the things that God gave to you in his blessings? And when God did not give unto you the things that you wanted, were you resentful against God, angry and bitter against him? These are the kinds of questions we have to ask ourselves when measuring ourselves against this standard of loving the Lord our God. Now, as you can see, Jesus has set the bar very high. But he's going to set the bar even higher than that. He said that the summary of the law is love. And then he adds four alls. With all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. These four things, heart, soul, mind, and strength, sum up all of the faculties of the human being, all of the powers of our inward man. So we ask the question, did you love God this week? You might say, well, I managed to love God this week. There were times this week when my heart was so filled with joy at my salvation that I looked up to God and I really, I believed that I loved him. My heart was lifted up in love to God this week. And that's good. But the question comes back, did you do that all the time? Or only occasionally? Was there a time this week, or in your life at all, when your love grew cold? And did you love the Lord your God with all your heart, or with only part of your heart? Did you love yourself more than you loved God this week? Was your motivation in what you did this week your own good, your own pleasure, your own comfort, your own convenience, or was it the glory of God? Always and only the glory of God. That's the goal. That's the standard that Jesus Christ sets here. Because God, remember, is not satisfied with a half-hearted devotion. Often we think, in our foolishness, we can give God the leftovers. After we have consumed most of our life, our time, our resources, our talents, our strength, our affection, upon ourselves, there's a little bit left over at the end of the day which we can then give to God and we think that God should be satisfied with that. And God says no, oh no, I don't want the leftovers. I don't even want the lion's share. I want all of it, all of it. I want your love with your whole heart, all your heart, and with your whole soul, all your soul, and with your whole mind, all your mind, and with your whole strength, all your strength, everything in your being is to be directed in love toward me. That's God's demand of us. You might think to yourself in your sinful thoughts, that's very unreasonable. Perhaps your heart might rise up in indignation against the God who would make such a demand as this. Then think about this. God is love. And think of the love with which God has loved us, his children. Think of the intensity of devotion with which God loves us. 
And God therefore demands that we love him with all the intensity that we can as creatures devote to him. Does his love for us, do you really believe that his love for us deserves only a half-hearted response? Remember who God is. He is the infinitely holy and blessed, adorable God of infinite beauty and majesty, the God of spotless holiness, perfect wisdom, unfailing love and goodness. Does this God, the creator of all things, who gave us being and breath and every good and perfect gift, does this God not deserve all of our devotion and worship and love? Ought we not to say with the psalmist in sincerity that our heart thirsts after God as we sang in Psalm 42 or in Psalm 73, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. That's what God demands of us. That's what the mirror says. And now we must look into the mirror and not shrink back in horror, but take a good long look, a penetrating gaze, as it were, into the mirror and ask ourselves, is my reflection like that? When I look into the mirror, do I see one who loves God staring back at me? And am I tempted when I don't see that to look for a more flattering mirror which will tell me that I am actually the fairest of them all, or at least pretty good in comparison to other people? And the answer, of course, is of course we do not measure up to such a standard. But Jesus has not finished with his explanation of the law of God because he goes on in verse 31 of Mark 12 to add this. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Notice, however, that this second commandment is not to be held independently of the first. First is love for God, and out of love for God must flow love to the neighbor. And that is not what the world does, or what much of the false church does. They put the second commandment as if it were the first. And in fact, they ignore the first, and think they can keep only the second. There's much talk in the unbelieving world of love for the neighbor, but almost nothing about love for God. And by love for the neighbor they mean tolerance of all people, of all religions and all lifestyles, acceptance of all things, and promotion of all things, even the most vile and wicked and sinful of things. But Jesus makes clear that you cannot love your neighbor, cannot even begin to love your neighbor unless you love God. The Bible makes it very clear that anything which is not love for God cannot be love for the neighbor. And when something which claims to be love for the neighbor conflicts with obedience toward God, it is not love for God, it is not love for the neighbor, it is in fact hatred. It's hatred. And think of the spectacle we have today in our society. We have atheists claiming to love their neighbor. Atheists claiming this. Atheists who deny the existence of the God who made the neighbor and who set the neighbor providentially upon our path. How in the world can an atheist love his neighbor? The idea is impossible, it's inconceivable. Or we have a church, a false church, which does not believe the word of God, which denies the biblical God as he has revealed himself in scripture, 
and they claim to be loving their neighbour when they give up the preaching of the word and have a soup kitchen for the poor. That's not love for the neighbour, and that's not love for God either. That's an abomination in the sight of God. Or think of these ungodly charitable events. You have ungodly singers. Some of them are divorced and remarried several times. Some of them are drug addicts and alcoholics. Some of them are homosexuals. They gather themselves together on the Lord's Day, mind you, for a concert to raise money for the poor, for the hungry in Africa, let's say. But that's not love for the neighbor, and it's not love for God. What is therefore love for the neighbor? And who is the neighbor? Well, Jesus tells us who the neighbor is. The neighbor is anyone whom God in his providence places upon our pathway in life, whom we have the calling to help. We are called to love him or her, our neighbor. And this love for the neighbor must begin at home. We have the saying, charity begins at home, but well, love for the neighbor begins at home as well. The first neighbor you are called to love is your wife or your husband, your parents or your children, those with whom you live ordinarily. You cannot claim to love your neighbor in Africa or in the inner city if you do not love your wife or your husband or your children. The second neighbor you are called to love is the member of the church. And you are called to love the other members of the church by coming together with them on the Lord's day to worship the Lord, by helping them in their distresses, by praying for them, encouraging them, leading them in the way of righteousness, and all the other things that Christians are supposed to do for their fellow believers. We don't end there, though. No. We love our neighbor in the home. We love our neighbor in the church. And we love our neighbor in the world. We love our neighbors who are ungodly. We love those who live near unto us. The people who cross our pathway in God's providence. The people we go to school with, perhaps. Our teacher at school our university professor who teaches us, who might be a godly person, the ones that we share accommodation with, the ones we work with. We love these neighbours as God gives us opportunity at anyone we happen to meet. And this too was something new for the Pharisees because the Pharisees believe that love for the neighbour should be restricted only to the Jews. And Jesus, in his famous parable, teaches them that God demands that we love even our enemies. The Samaritan loved the Jew, and we should go and do likewise. They said, no, God doesn't tell us to love the Samaritans or, or the Gentiles. We hate them. We only love the Jews. That was their saying. Love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. And Jesus said, no, the law of God demands that you love your enemy. Do not harbor malice or ill will in your heart against your neighbor, your godly neighbor or your enemy. Do not speak cruel, cutting words against your enemy or your neighbor or your friend words which are designed to hurt them. Do not commit evil deeds against your neighbor, defrauding them. Do not, in short, do anything which is designed to harm your neighbor. And go further than that, don't just do no one any harm, but do your neighbor good. Be kind to him. Be generous to him. 
And when he curses you, bless him in return. And when he is opposed to you, pray for him. When he's hungry, feed him. When he's cold, clothe him. When he's in distress or trouble, do your best to help him. That's the calling of the second part of this demand of the law. Love God and love your neighbor. And love your neighbor with the same love with which you love yourself. You do not need to be taught to love yourself. You come into the world already loving yourself. But put yourself after your neighbor. That's the calling. And loving your neighbor is more than smiling at your neighbor or even giving your neighbor a box of groceries when he is hungry, both of which, of course, are good things to do. But love of the neighbor must seek his or her ultimate good, which means that love for the neighbor must seek his or her salvation. And so with the kind smile and with the box of groceries must come the word of God. You must speak to your neighbor about the word of God as he gives you opportunity. Love the neighbor, therefore, is not what our politically correct world has to say. It's not tolerance for what our neighbor does. It's not treating all of our neighbors as if they have some kind of equality. No, love for our neighbor involves rebuking our neighbor when he sins and calling our neighbor to repentance and refusing to condone or approve of our neighbor's sin. Love for the neighbor is performed by the true church when the true church preaches against sin and preaches against false doctrine and preaches against particular heretics who are deceiving God's people in the church. That's love. That's love for the heretic because you're hoping the heretic will repent but it's also and more especially love for those who are being deceived by the heretic. Now that kind of love of course will be misunderstood. It will be rejected and it will even be labeled as if it were hatred. But that is true biblical love. Here's a verse from Leviticus 19 verse 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Now how does one hate one's brother in one's heart according to that verse? Read on. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. In other words, not to rebuke your neighbor is to hate him in your heart. Permissive love, as the world calls it, is really hatred. Ecumenical acceptance of all churches and opinions is really, but it all boils down to it, hatred. That's what Leviticus 19 verse 17 says. So here we have the perfect mirror of God's word, the standard by which God measures all things, and that is perfect love for God and perfect love for the neighbor. And the Heidelberg Catechism, after having set that forth, asks the inevitable question, question five, canst thou keep all these things perfectly? And the answer is no. In no wise. Not at all. No, I cannot. In fact, when we look into the mirror of God's law, as it has been described here and summarized by Jesus Christ, we see an ugly figure staring back at us. It is a God hitter and a neighbor hitter. I am prone 
by nature to hate God and my neighbor. We all know what hatred is. Hatred is a nasty, ugly word. No one likes to speak about hatred. And hatred is the exact opposite of the demand of God's law. God says, love me. Love me with your whole heart and your whole mind and your whole soul and all of your strength and love your neighbor as yourself and our response is to hate. To hate. We do not hit the target. We do not simply fall slightly short of the target. We do not even come close to hitting the target. In fact, we shoot deliberately in the opposite direction. Our attitude towards God, the holy lawgiver, is not affection, not deep, ardent love, not even cold indifference, but intense loathing, active hostility. That's what our Heidelberg Catechism is saying. And that hatred towards God naturally spills over toward the neighbor into ill will, evil intent, malice and spite toward the neighbor. Now most people, if they heard this message this evening, would be terribly offended at it. What? Are you saying that I am a God hater? Are you claiming that I am one who hates his neighbor? Is that not a little bit, in fact, very much extreme? I would not put it as strongly as that. Oh yes, I will admit that my life is not perfect. I don't love my neighbor as much as I should love my neighbor, but I wouldn't call myself one who hates my neighbor and hates God. But the Bible does put it as strongly as that. Here's Romans 8 verse 7. The carnal mind, that is the mind of one who does not have the spirit of Jesus Christ. The mind of the unbeliever, the carnal mind of the flesh, is enmity or opposition or hostility, enmity against God. Titus 3 verse 3 speaks about how God's people on the island of Crete, and Paul includes itself too, were living before the gospel of God's grace came to them, and it says this, they were, quote, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. <coughs> Now if the mirror into which you are accustomed to look is not telling you that about yourself, you are not looking into the right mirror. You are looking into a different mirror, most likely the mirror of comparing yourself with other people and saying to yourself, well, I'm not as bad as him, or I'm not as bad as her, I'm pretty much better than those people out right there. You're not looking into the mirror of God's law and comparing yourself with that. Or perhaps you're looking into the mirror of political correctness and tolerance of our ungodly age. Or if you're more of a religious person, you're looking into the mirror of Pelagianism, which is the teaching that man is basically good. That's the view you'll hear in liberal churches. Man is basically good. Or semi-Pelagianism, which is a modified form of the first heresy, which is, okay, man has fallen into sin, we'll give you that, but there's still much good remaining in him. And with the help of the grace of God with which he can cooperate, he can perform much good, there's much spiritual life left in him, he's really only sick, not really dead, and that's the view also of much of liberalism, and is officially the view of the Roman Catholic Church. Or you're looking into the mirror of Arminianism, 
which says that man has lost a lot of what he had, but man still has his free will. And man can cooperate with the grace of God, at least not resist the grace of God with his free will. But these mirrors, Pelagianism, semi-Pelagianism, and Arminianism, big words, but these three mirrors, which are popular in many churches today, are simply lying mirrors. Mirrors which tell the person as the fairy tale goes, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? Oh, you. Oh, you. And you go to these churches, and they flatter you by telling you that really you are a very good person, and there's really nothing much wrong with you, and God will accept you just the way you are. But we must not, beloved, be flattered and deceived by false nerves. We must, as painful as it might be to us, look into this mirror. This mirror which shows us how ugly we are by nature and declares to us, I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbor. And that hatred to God and the neighbor shows itself in our disobedience. God says to us, put me first in your life. Serve me. Devote your entire life, your entire being to me. And we say, in our hatred, no, I will not. I will serve myself. And if God's commandments get in the way of my serving of myself, then I will trample over God's commandments. I might go through the, the motions of outward obedience to some of God's commandments. But I will not give him my heart. I will serve him only as far as it suits me, only as far as it is convenient to me, only as far as I can get some benefit out of it. But if it becomes inconvenient or difficult or brings persecution upon me or upsets my family or my friends, well then I will not obey God in those areas of life because God is not the most important. His glory is not the chief end of me. The chief end of me is my own convenience. And that's true of our neighbor as well. God says, live in such a way as always to promote the welfare of your neighbor. And our response is to say, no, I will not. I will live in such a way as always to promote my own welfare. And if my neighbor gets in my way, I will trample him underfoot. I will be cruel to him. I will speak evil of him. I will be angry against him if he does not serve my happiness. And sometimes we will even disguise this as a kind of love for our neighbor. We say, I love you. My neighbor, I love you, my wife or my husband, I love you, but really we are manipulating our husband or wife or other neighbor to do what we want them to do. And when they do not do what we want them to do, we are no longer saying to them, I love you. We are no longer happy with them. And people really are, in our minds, simply tools to make us happy and to give us what we want. And the idea of a sacrificial love, a love which puts others before me, I know nothing about that, I want to know nothing about that, I will not do that, and that, beloved, is hatred for the neighbour. And this was the confession, I am prone by nature to hate God and to hate my neighbour. This was the confession that Jesus Christ was seeking to bring forth from this scribe. As it were, 
The scribe thought he was testing Jesus, but Jesus turns the tables on the scribe and says, Really? I am testing you. I am holding up before you, self-righteous, so-called expert in the law. I am holding up before you the true mirror of the law. You want to know what the greatest of all the commandments is? I will tell you it is to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Can't you see you're wasting your time in these abstract theological discussions? Look into the law. Not abstractly, but personally. Look into the law, and what scribe, what scribe do you see? And the scribe was impressed by Christ's answer. You see that in verse 32. After Jesus had explained what the law is in its essence, he said, that is, the scribe said, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth, for there is one God, and there is none other but he, and to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And so the scribe had progressed a little bit in his understanding. The scribe had begun to see, perhaps for the first time, that the law is deeper and more searching than he had first thought. But in Mark 12, although there was some progress, the scribe had not gone far enough. Because Jesus says to him in verse 34, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. What needed to happen in the life of this scribe was that he look deeply into the mirror and compare his own reflection in what he had just confessed to be the demands of the law. The scribe had confessed, oh yes, to love God, that is the most important thing. But now the scribe must look into the mirror and ask another question. Do I, do I love God and do I love my neighbor? Do I do it perfectly? And indeed, can I do it perfectly? And sadly, there's no evidence in the Bible to suggest that the scribe went that extra step. Very likely, the scribe went back to his fellow scribes and Pharisees with a certain amount of admiration for this Jesus, pleased by Jesus' answer, but not cured of his self-righteous pride. And now when this question comes up again in a theological debate, the scribe knows the right answer. He can tell them, oh yes, I know, it's the love of the Lord, you love from your heart and soul and mind and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. But the question is, did the scribe see his own shortcomings when he looked into this mirror? Was he troubled by what he saw, and did he sometime in the future seek forgiveness from Jesus Christ? We do not know. We leave that with God. But notice for ourselves, it's very easy to speak learnedly about the law, to speak about sin, to rhyme off the orthodox doctrine of total depravity, but then to miss our own reflection in the mirror of God's law. To miss the fact that the God-hater looking back from the mirror is ourselves. Because notice how the Heidelberg Catechism approaches this. It doesn't ask the question in an abstract way. It doesn't allow us to even consider the question in an abstract way and say, what do you think about sin? Oh no, oh no. It asks the question, whence knowest thy, thy misery? I'm talking, says the Catechism, 
I'm talking about your own particular misery. How do you know that? And then it asks the question, canst thou keep all these things perfectly? And then it has to answer the question in no wise, for I, I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbour. We are prone by nature to hate God and the neighbour. That's not how God made us to hate. He made us to love him. But that's our nature as sinners. And the Catechism will go on to explain how it is that we have fallen into sin and become such as now by nature hate God and the neighbour. But for now you must see that this is actually what we are by nature. We must confess this to ourselves. We must come clean as it were to ourselves and stop hiding in our own self-righteousness and say about ourselves, yes, this describes me perfectly. And that must have a, an effect upon us. When we see that, it must have an effect upon our consciousness. It must make us weep. Not necessarily you have to shed actual tears, but it must cause us to be miserable. That's why I ask the question, whence knowest thou thy misery? And the fact that we, by nature, hate God and our neighbour is our misery. That's our misery. Nothing else really is our misery. That's our misery. And that's the Gospel in Lord's Day too. The fact that we are miserable when we look into this mirror of God's Word, which is perfect, reflection of who God is, and we see our own ugly, God-hitting, neighbor-hitting reflection, the fact that that causes us misery is something very significant. Because that's not what causes other people misery. When an unbeliever looks into the mirror of God's Word, God's law, either he doesn't even see his misery because he's blind to it. Or he does have at least a certain beginning of understanding of it, but he doesn't care. He doesn't care. It doesn't trouble him in the least that he is one who hates God and the neighbor. But the child of God both sees it, understands it, and is troubled by it mourns over the ugly reflection in the mirror. Why is that? Well, it's because the child of God is more than what he is by nature. By nature, he is a God-hater. But he's also something by grace. By grace, he is not a God-hater. By grace, he is someone who genuinely, yet imperfectly, loves God. Because a work has been performed in him by Jesus Christ. Lord's Day 2 presupposes this. The one in Lord's Day 2 who confesses that by nature he hates God and the neighbour is the one who in Lord's Day 1 confess that he belongs to Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ has satisfied for all of the sins of that one. The sin of hating God and hating the neighbour. And Christ has worked in that one, that child of God, by the Holy Spirit. And the work of the Spirit has done three things in the child of God. First, the Holy Spirit has opened the eyes of the Christian to understand the meaning of the reflection in the mirror, to see the ugliness of it. That's something that the unbeliever doesn't 
seen. How the Holy Spirit second has created a heartfelt sorrow over what he sees, over the ugliness of the reflection that the unbeliever does not have. The unbeliever does not have sorrow over his sin. The unbeliever loves his sin and boasts even in his sin. Is not troubled by his sin. Is not troubled by the fact that he hates God and his neighbor. Is troubled only by the certain consequences of sin which come into his life. And third, the Holy Spirit has created in the believer a real, sincere desire to love God and the neighbor. And the unbeliever has no such desire. So when we look, beloved, into the mirror of God's law, and we see the ugly creature staring back at us, the God hater and the neighbor hater. This must trouble us. It must. Every day, we, every year, we hear Lord's Day too expounded. This must <coughs> trouble us. It will trouble us even until the day we die, because only then will we be finally rid of that God hating, neighbor hating nature. But the comfort, beloved, is this, that ugly, God-hating, neighbor-hating figure was crucified with Christ. And God, by Christ, by the Holy Spirit, is working in us a new man, a different reflection. The reflection of himself, who is the image of God, the perfect reflection of the Father. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we confess that we are spiritually ugly as we compare ourselves with the perfect standard of my word. We ask for forgiveness. We ask that you will comfort us through the preaching of my word and humble us draw us to Jesus Christ. We ask it for Christ's sake. Amen.